My first video on DRS mechanics explored two core questions. What is a DRS, and how does a DRS interact with a generic damage rider? This video is going to expand on the foundations of the first one, and it's going to try to answer three core questions. First of all, how exactly do we quantify how good a build is at abusing DRS mechanics? Second of all, what are the best builds to abuse DRS mechanics? And third of all, just how much damage can these builds actually deal? Now, I should warn you, before I get into anything here, this video is very analysis heavy. And I am not going to be explaining how DRS works here, so if you haven't seen the first video or don't already understand what DRS is and how they interact with generic damage riders, you should really go and watch the first one. The first thing we're going to do is show a little bit of math, which allows you to approximate and basically quantify how good a build, roughly speaking, is at abusing DRS mechanics. This is important because we can use this exact metric to compare two different builds to each other, and without truly knowing how much damage the build actually deals, we could basically guess which one is going to be better at abusing DRS mechanics, and by extension, which one can deal more damage in total. So to get started on quantifying a build's ability to abuse DRS mechanics, we need to figure out how many damage sources the build can generate per attack. So in this all too familiar example of TB throw, we have a total of 7, where one of them, the Lightning Jabber, is going to be the original damage source, and then the other 6 will be damage rider sources, so 7 in total. Next we need to figure out how many attacks the build can do per turn. So in the case of a classic TB throw split, you get 11 levels in fighter, then a bloodlust elixir and a potion of speed. So what this will give you is 3 attacks per action from being 11 fighter, and then 3 total actions from the speed potion and bloodlust, which gives you a total of 9 throws of lightning jabber per round or per turn. So with these two numbers in mind, we can now figure out how many total damage sources the build can generate per round or per turn. In this case we have 9 attacks, with 7 sources per attack, so we get a total of 63 sources per turn. We also need to calculate what the set of generic damage riders that will be procking on every single source is actually worth. So in this case this is a 3d4 plus 9, this is 1d4, this is also a 1d4, and this is also a 1d4, then plus 3 from Rhapsody, plus 4 from Arcane Charge, and then plus 2 from Callous Glow, so 3d4 plus 9 in total. If we then take all this information and we multiply it out, what we get is that there are 63 sources, each source will proc one instance of this damage, resulting in a combined total per round of 189d4 plus 587 damage from nothing but generic damage riders. So this averages out to be about 1060 per round. Before we continue, I'd like to quickly establish what exactly this number here is a representation of and why it is so important for our purposes. What this number is really a calculation of is just the total sum of damage riders, generic damage riders to be precise, not DRS, per round. It isn't necessarily how much a build is gaining from DRS, although it's a pretty good estimation of that. If you think about it, really the point of abusing DRS is just to proc more generic damage riders or as many of these as possible per turn. It isn't really perfect because, well, this calculation includes sources that actually should be there. So like in the case of TB Throw, this should be a 6, not a 7, because one of the sources is legitimate, it really should be there. But this estimation is really good. It's simple math, it doesn't require us to try and figure out what is a DRS and what is a source, which by the way in some builds like, for example, GI sneak attack abuse is actually very hard. Um, basically it's a generalization, or an estimation, and it's a pretty good estimation at that. And the way we're going to be using this estimation is to basically compare two different builds against each other. Whichever one has the higher number, generally speaking, is better at abusing DRS because it's gaining more from generic damage riders than the other one is. Now, even though I plan to mostly use this generalization to compare builds, I do think it's also worth comparing how much builds actually do in terms of total damage. So, in the case of TB Throw, we can do this math pretty simply. We already know this number over here, this is how much the build is gaining from generic damage riders. The other half of the equation is to figure out how much it's gaining from the sources. So we take the number of attacks in total, we take the total sum of damage from the sources per attack, this is the sum for TB throw, we multiply this out and then we average this out to 288. So in total, excluding crits, vulnerabilities, and other externals, TB Throw should be able to deal approximately 1,348 damage per round 
with DRS abuse, and excluding crits and all kinds of other stuff like that. Now, the problem is that there are going to be builds, in fact the other two builds in this video, which are going to want to abuse the fact that you can cause an automatic critical hit via paralysis to make some of the more potent DRS effects actually work. So for the sake of keeping things consistent, I went ahead and did the math for what that would look like on TB throw to have a good comparison point against those builds. So first let's consider what it would look like with paralysis. We apply hold monster or hold person or something. This makes every single throw, assuming it's done from melee range, a critical hit. Critical hits will double all of our damage dice, so we take the initial equations, we double the rolls, so just like the d4, the d4, the d6, and then we redo the average to get us approximately 2,000 damage. And then, assuming you also wanted to for some reason, Perilous Stakes is very easy to apply. This gives global vulnerability, which doubles damage taken from all sources. So, with vulnerability and automatic crits, the, let's call it, damage maximum of TB throw is 4,000. This number is good to keep in mind because we're going to be using it as a good comparison point against the other two builds mentioned in this video. The next build I'm going to cover is going to revolve around the combination of items and abilities that you see on screen here. Now, the star of the show here is Crimson Mischief. If you don't already know, this item is probably the third strongest item in the entire game, behind only Falara Louvre and Luminous Armor. Basically, this item's passive, Redvine Savagery, is going to add a 7 flat piercing damage to every attack made with advantage. An advantage is super easy to get, like with Risky Ring or something. So you basically always are going to be getting it. Now, this flat 7 damage is a DRS, but also very uniquely can proc the effects of these two items, which shouldn't be possible normally. These two items work in the exact same way. If you land a critical hit while attacking with either of them, then it will add a 7 flat piercing damage to the attack, kind of like this item, but on critical hits instead. The thing is, if you land a critical hit while holding this item and proc Redvine Savagery at the same time, then for some reason it also procs the effects of these two items even if you're not actually attacking with them. So basically the combination of this item with advantage, if you swing with this item with advantage, excuse me, plus a force critical hit like with paralysis, uh, hold monster, hold person, like whatever, take your pick. And then these two items results in you getting the normal attack, then a DRS, and then you get these two items as generic damage sources, which is plus 14 flat damage that is incredibly high. If you recall, the combined flat damage of, for instance, TB throw was plus 9. So yeah, this is very, very, very high. Now, because we need to force a critical hit for this combination to work, we may as well also equip Crater Flesh Gloves, which are adding another 1d6 force damage DRS to every attack if it's a critical hit. Now, the rest of the stuff is pretty standard stuff. Worth noting that Crater Flesh Gloves don't proc Falara Louvre like many other DRS do, but that's okay, we don't really care that much. And everything else here is standard. Hex is just 1d6 instead of 1d4 like Psionic Overload, but it works in the exact same way. Okay, so we're going to take these items, abilities, and effects and use them with the combination of 5 levels in any martial and then 5 levels in any warlock subclass with Pact of the Blade. This combination is very potent because 5 levels in martial gives you extra attack, and then 5 levels in any warlock subclass with Pact of the Blade gives you a different kind of extra attack, and these two are going to stack together to give you 3 attacks per action. The Marshal of Choice here is a Paladin, because Paladins get access to Divine Smite. Divine Smite is a DRS, and will also proc Falara Louvre, meaning as long as you have spell slots available to click Divine Smite, you are getting two extra DRS on that attack. Anyway, so we take this combination, we use it with a Bloodlust Elixir, and a Potion of Speed, which gives us the ideal 9 attacks per round, just like an 11 fighter. Okay, so just like in our TB throw example, we have figured out how many attacks we get per round. Now we need to figure out how many sources we get per attack. In this case, the answer is 7. Notably, the 7 is only going to be the case when you have spell slots available for Divine Smite, but the classic lock and split is 7 Paladin, 5 Warlock, which will give you exactly 9 spell slots and therefore one full turn of a perfect 7. Anyway, so we are going to have three instances of Falara Louvre, Crater Flesh, Divine Smite, the passive of Crimson Mischief, and then Crimson Mischief itself. Crimson Mischief is the only generic source here, the other six, just like TB Throw, are DRS. From this point, we can now start making our generalization. So just like TB Throw, we have 63 total sources per round. 
the combined damage of our set of generic damage riders is going to be 1d4, this is from Sonic Overload, the 1d6 from Hex, and then all of the flat modifiers together, which is plus 20. Very, very high. That is a terrifyingly high number. We multiply this out to get this equation, we then average this out to get a combined average of 1638 damage, so long as you have smite slots available. So we have basically quantified the gain from DRS of TB Throw and Pyrsidon, by the way that's the build's name, Pyrsidon, and we can compare the two together, so TB Throw is 1060, Pyrsidon with access to smite is 1638, and without smite is still a bit higher at 1170. Now, there are a couple of things missing here. Notably, Pyrsidon does require critical hits to pull this off. So really it would have made more sense to do this combination, or sorry, these averages assuming critical hits. But for the sake of simplicity, we didn't do it, and to be honest, you don't even have to. Pyrsidon is very obviously ahead of TB Throw in this regard. But if you wanted to be accurate, you should redo the calculation with double dice rolled for both, and then you would get a more accurate estimation of how they stack up against each other. Anyway. If we are looking purely at single target damage marshals, Pyrsidon is definitely the best DRS abuser currently in the game. I have tested quite a few different builds including obviously TB Throw, multiple variations of Titan String, and Pyrsidon is pretty obviously the best. Titan String is pretty close, but Pyrsidon still is higher. Now, the thing is that these two builds are both martial builds, and in general caster builds do not come up often in DRS abuse discussions other than EB, which isn't really a particularly great one. So what we're going to now do is we're going to look at what happens if you start applying DRS abuse to caster builds. Okay, so what exactly can casters do to abuse DRS mechanics? Well, like our two martial builds, we need to find the largest number of attacks per turn that a caster can achieve, and to do that we first have to consider what is the largest number of casts per turn that a caster can achieve. So we can run Haste, Bloodlust, Quicken Magic, 3 Thief Rogue, and Helmet of Grit, which would in total give us 6 casts of any given spell per turn, uh, by virtue of having 3 actions and 3 bonus actions. We can then take Meta Magic from Sorcerer and get Free Casting slash Arcane Battery, which would give us a total of 6 level 5 spell slots, assuming of course that we use Meta Magic to move some of our lower level spell slots to become level 5 ones, but regardless we basically get 6 level 5 casts per turn. So right away, if the goal is to maximize attacks, the obvious answer should be Magic Missile. Magic Missile at a level 5 spell slot could hit up to 8 times per turn. So 8 times 6 is 48, and therefore 48 base attacks. This is noticeably significantly higher than the measly 9 that a Marshal could achieve. Now, the main problem with Magic Missile, if you don't already know, is that it isn't an attack roll, and therefore the only major DRS it can benefit from is Flora Loof. It also cannot benefit from some major generic damage riders like Hex. Still, we can get a total of 96 damage sources in one round, which is a pretty good start and is obviously much higher than the two martial builds. Luckily for us, there is another spell which functions very similarly to Magic Missile, but happens to be an attack roll in the form of Scorching Ray. Now, Scorching Ray is a little bit worse in terms of the number of projectiles fired by the level of the spell cast in the sense that at a level 5 spell cast, it only fires 6 projectiles, so across 6 casts you would have 36 attacks, not as good as 48. Now I know what you're thinking, you're probably thinking, okay, well the benefit of Scorching Ray is that because it's an attack roll, it can benefit from Spell Might. And this would be a good guess, but actually the more relevant thing here is going to be Crater Flesh Gloves. If you think about it, attack rolls can crit, and we can actually force critical hits on every single Scorching Ray with Paralysis, and therefore every single Scorching Ray could benefit from both Falara Louv and Crater Flesh Gloves. In other words, 6 casts of Scorching Ray would net you a staggeringly high 108 total damage sources, and every single one of them can be a critical hit. It's worth mentioning that outside of the insanely high number of total damage sources that Scorching Ray can achieve, it can also benefit from quite a couple of interesting bonuses. For example, unlike Magic Missile, it can benefit from Hex and then Koreska's Flame and Flame of Wrath, which both come from the legendary staff Markham Heshkir. It can also proc the Spine Shutter Amulet for Reverberation once per cast, which will add an additional 6 DRS per round. I'm sorry, not DRS, just regular sources, but you get the point. 
Finally, Scorching Ray builds don't actually have a contested bow slot, so you could use the Jolt Shooter and pick up a couple of lightning charges for an extra generic damage rider during setup. So let's put it all together. As discussed before, this combination of classes, items, and abilities slash effects is going to net us a total of 6 casts of level 5 Scorching Rays. Each level 5 Scorching Ray is basically 6 attacks, so we have a total of 36 attacks in one round. We are going to be able to get 3 sources per attack, one from the Ray, one from Crater Flesh Gloves, and one from Falora Louvre. Let's now do the estimation like the other two. So we have 36 attacks per round, or 6 casts of Scorching Ray. We have 3 sources per attack, and then we also gain 6 more because we have 6 casts of Scorching Ray and each one will proc reverberation once. So in total we have 114 sources per round. Then if we were to add up all of our general, generic, excuse me, damage riders, we get 1d4 from Psionic Overload, 1d6 from Hex, and then the flat ones, plus 9 from Arcane Charge, the Ring, and then Rhapsody. And then another one from a Lightning Charge, which we can get with our bow. And then another plus 5, which would be our maximum charisma modifier on this build, from Flame of Wrath, which is surprisingly a generic damage rider. So we can now multiply this out. We have 114 sources, we have the total damage of one set of generic riders. So multiplying this out, we get 114d4 plus 114d6, that's already very high, and then we add another 1710 flat damage. Whew. So in total, this averages out to 2394 damage. Wow. Okay, so if we compare the numbers from Fire Sorcerer to the other two, it's pretty clear that at least among these three, Fire Sorcerer is definitely the better abuser of DRS. And honestly, as far as I know, Fire Sorcerer is probably the best single target abuser of DRS in the entire game. There is very, very few builds, barring area of effect DRS abusers, that can even come close to the damage this thing will deal with just its damage riders alone. And that isn't even accounting for the build's full damage. Now, naturally, some of you are curious. Like, TB Throw, for example, can produce 4,000 damage at its damage maximum. So what by comparison is the damage maximum of Fire Sorcerer? Well, that's actually a fairly easy calculation to do. Let's look at that now. I want to quickly preface this by saying that Crater Flesh Gloves is included here, and this is not a calculation for a critical hit, so to some degree this is wrong, but we're going to do the critical hits in a second. I just wanted to show what this looks like if you don't account for critical hits. So 36 attacks, then we combine the damage of all the sources. If you don't know what this is, you get 2d6 from the Scorching Ray, 1d6 from Crater Flesh Gloves, 1d4 from Falara Louvre, and then plus 5, this is your Charisma modifier, which you gain from Elemental Affinity by being a level 6 uh, Sorcerer with Draconic Bloodline in one of the Fire ones. Then 64 is the flat addition from Reverberations, and in total this works out to 108d6 plus 42d4 plus 180. That will average out to 663. So adding that with the sum of our riders, we get 3057. Now, again, this isn't totally accurate, because really what we want to be looking at is this. Wait, because again, we need to be accounting for the fact that Crater Flesh Gloves require a critical hit. Assuming that you have a target paralyzed and you walk into melee range to cast your Scorching Ray, you will then get an automatic critical hit on every single one of them, which will double all of your damage dice, which I've done up here. If you average this out, you get 4266, which if you remember, the total damage, as in the damage maximum of TB Throw, was a little under 4000, so we are already higher than the maximum damage of TB Throw, and we haven't even accounted for vulnerability yet, which if we were to account for vulnerability, brings the total sum of damage to 8532. This is basically entering like 50,000 ton owlbear slash Hamaraf territory, and those are like AoE damage builds, so... Yeah, I mean, this is obviously very broken. This is obviously completely not how the game was intended to be played. And this is obviously a horrendously impractical build. But I do think, if nothing else, the thing that this build is showing off is the sheer degree to which DRS mechanics are broken. To bring this video to a conclusion, I'd like to make two important points. First of all, 
Don't expect DRS mechanics to be around forever. They are eventually going to be patched out. I mean, there is simply no way that these mechanics are intended, and if they are, I think it just demonstrates a failure of biblical proportions by Larian. Anyways, the point of this video was to demonstrate how the builds out there which are dealing multiple thousands of damage per turn are doing it. Without fail, if it's a single target build and you're seeing it deal thousands of damage, it is abusing DRS to some degree. And I think it's important for the average player to understand this because when they read these build guides and they are seeing this mechanic, you have to understand that this mechanic is eventually going to be patched out. And while you can currently abuse it to deal, well, stratospherically high amounts of damage, eventually it's not going to be a thing anymore and everything is going to just kind of equalize again. But until then, the information is there, you know now which builds are crazy, and you have some good benchmarks to compare them against. Have fun, abuse DRS to your heart's content. That's it guys, goodbye.